This is She's on Call, a weekly show hosted by ENT specialist Dr. Sajana Chandrasekhar and general surgeon Dr. Marina Kurian. They'll be joined by guest experts to discuss an array of newsworthy medical and health issues. You're invited to ask the doctors anything. The physicians and their guests' views are their own and do not represent any institution. Please contact your doctor for any personal questions. Please hit share and join us live on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube at She's On Call. Hashtag She's On Call. Please welcome our hosts. Hello, I'm Dr. Sujana Chandrasekhar. I'm an ear, nose, and throat surgeon with ENT and Allergy Associates in New York and New Jersey. I'm Marina Curran. I'm a general surgeon, do minimally invasive surgery, weight loss surgery, and actually some uh, medical weight loss here in New York City. Welcome to She's On Call. Uh, Marina and I have been doing this for a couple of months now, and uh, I think we've hit our stride, so I hope you think so too. Uh, each week, we focus on a different medical topic, and this week's medical topic is going to be orthopedic injuries, how you can identify them and what you can do about them. That's right. But, you know, if you guys have been following along with us, which I hope you have, and if not, you should make it a plan, 11 to 12, have your coffee, don't read your paper, come with <laughs> instead, um, that we will also talk about some topics of the week. But we have two great uh, guests that you should be Looking forward to one is Dr. Claudette Lajam. She's at NYU. She's a, uh, a knee and hip or a joint specialist. And also we have Dr. Ben Chang, who's from the University of Pennsylvania and Children's Hospital of Pennsylvania, and he's a plastic surgeon. So we're very excited to have both of them on. Uh, but it's time for the news of the week. And don't forget, we are live on YouTube and Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn and scroll.in. And please um, tag your friends and share and let them know to come on. Uh, I don't think any of us have uh, survived without a joint injury here or there. So it would be great to have as many people as possible watch. Yeah, but um, one of the things was this, this during quarantine, all the people trying to do these, like me, trying to do things that I've never done before because I was like, I got to get some exercise in. So it's going to be exciting to join them. But we should start with some of the topics of the week. and. And certainly, you know, Suju and I are based in the tri-state area, and uh, there's a consortium or a coalition where uh, New Jersey, Connecticut, and New York are making plans as sort of the tri-state, which we, we certainly are the tri-state. So uh, currently, we have a restriction of 40 states that we uh, can't travel to without going to um, – uh, quarantine. Like, so when you go there and you come back, you have to quarantine yourself for 10 to 14 days. And so I actually think it's more uh, appropriate now at this point to just point out the states that we can go to. Like, wait a second, Vermont wasn't on our list, but now it looks like it is. Hang on, what happened? <laughs> Are we planning a Vermont getaway? Well, you can see on the bottom scroll the initials of all the states where you have to, if you come to one of our relatively clean states, you've got a quarantine. Globally, the cases are nearly 17.6 million and deaths are about 680,000. Unfortunately, the United States does lead the pack with 4.7 million cases and over 156,000 deaths. And when I first looked at the statistic two or three days ago, that number was actually not yet 150,000. So unfortunately, the numbers of deaths are really rising. Um, I think, Marina, you raised a really interesting point, and uh, former CDC head Tom Frieden tweeted about it. Right. Well, so... Many of you guys know, at first, I think that, you know, the U.S. numbers are really reflective of the, pack, of the fact that we are accurately reporting, which I can't say that of every other country in the world, right? So I think that the way uh, the U.S. is set up and our relative transparency in terms of identifying disease, that we've been able to really track the numbers and attribute the cases uh, appropriately to COVID. Um, Recently, though, there's been a change where the CDC, the Center for Disease Control in the U.S., was tracking all the COVID disease to the administration made a decision to change it to HHS. 
And um, this is Dr. Tom Frieden, who is a former head of the CDC, and basically saying that it took him uh, quite a bit to find out what the HHS is projecting and what you see on this slide uh, versus the slide that we showed you of 40 plus states where, you know, the tri-state area can't go to is that this, this is a representation of what the state's re representatives have said about COVID. So, you know, there's a different method of tracking, which I think can really affect our numbers. And there's actually, you know, a few graphs out there, which uh, I don't have today for you that have shown that uh, based on the switch between CDC and HHS reporting that we've seen some tapering of COVID. Um, but I, I feel like it's much more accurate if you look at the hospitals that we're reporting to the CDC um, than, than just our state representatives saying, yeah, we have some disease here, you know? So I think that that's quite a difference and something to be aware of. As summer progresses, you know, I, you know, we started this in June, right? Like it's, it's been a minute. And um, I couldn't imagine that we're already here. I thought by August we'd see a, a turn and we haven't. Um, I, I thought we'd stop talking about COVID so much by the eighth show, right? But uh, well, I don't know what we should do when, um, when we're, we're with, you know, people because we, we are pack animals and we need to be with people and how we should take care. Because apparently a lot of states are not doing as well. There's a second surge in Louisiana. Uh, which was a surprise outside of New Orleans where the first surge was. So I think, you know, as medical professionals, we're all a bit alarmed at these numbers because we've known since about April or so um, that if you do some simple stuff, uh, we can limit the spread of disease. And unfortunately, that requires, as Marina said, some a little bit of isolation, a little unnatural behavior like wearing a mask, but really seems to be very effective. Like this, these three states, New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut, where the numbers were soaring in the beginning, once these measures were put into effect, they really worked. So um, just to remind everybody, uh, one of our viewers, Deirdre, wrote in that she just dropped her son off in North Carolina and Less than half the people were wearing masks, even indoors. So let's just talk about COVID a little bit. COVID-19 is so named because it's a coronavirus disease that was initially described in a patient on December 31st, 2019. There were probably cases before, but that was the first report. So we really only know about it for the past eight months now. We have learned quite a bit. There are the three W's that we talk about. We have a little slide about that. We know that if you wear a mask, wash your hands, and watch your distance, keep six feet away from people when you're indoors uh, without a mask, but really ideally wear a mask whenever you're around people who are not in your household, um, you will protect yourself and others. So people ask, well, can I touch a doorknob? Can I press an elevator button? Yes, do all of that, and then don't stick your fingers in your mouth. Go home take off your shoes, wash your hands, and then go about your business. So wear a mask, wash your hands, and watch your distance. And that's how we flattened the curve up here where the cases were remarkably high. Uh, the president of the American Academy of Pediatrics was on our show last week, Dr. Sally, Sally or Sarah Goza. She goes by both names. Um, and she said, wearing is caring. And I think that's a really beautiful sentiment. If you care about your community and you care about the others around you, wear a mask. So I, you know, we had some pretty bad news coming from both the medical world and the camping world. Marina, do you want to talk about that for a bit? I actually want to talk about the New York Times article that recently came out saying that mask wearing might actually reduce uh, viral load. And, you know, there is some controversy over just wearing cloth masks without, but the masks that were uh, recommended uh, in the um, Times article were masks that did have some sort of filter in between the two cloth layers. So most of the cloth masks that people are recommending are three-ply, meaning that there's two layers of cloth and there's a filter in between, uh, but not all masks are like that. But the real key to this is if you're symptomatic, that you do not go out and you stay home. You don't go out and try and get groceries. You don't try and, and go to work. So I think the real 
key to this is if you're at risk, so if you're elderly, um, you want to stay home as much as you can and take precautions when you do go out. But if you're feeling ill, stay home and don't go anywhere, which is something that, you know, I mean, if I feel like I have a cold, I I still go to work, which now I have to rethink, right? Do I go to work if I'm, if I'm in a cold or not? Or if I feel, and the flu, forget about it. Everyone, if you have achy joints, et cetera, you need to stay home. So I really liked um, that New York Times article. I thought it gave some perspective. Um, and recently there was the, the whole summer camp issue where there was a camp in, I think it was Georgia, that uh, took a fair amount of precautions but they did not encourage mask wearing. And they feel that based on their analysis that this um, virus was spread by singing and cheering, because then of course you're using, you're projecting more and you're sending, if someone has a virus particle, sending it out further. So um, at that point uh, they, they uh, evaluated and the CDC found that 76% of the campers and staffers were ended up being positive for COVID. And then, you know, it's not like doctors and nurses are immune. So there were a number of residents of trainees in the anesthesia department at a Florida hospital who used all the precautions in the hospital and then all got together for a party, which ended up being what's called a super spreader event. And a significant number of them contracted coronavirus at this party where we all kind of let our guard down. And what happens is not only are these young people sick, and at some point we're going to have a physiatrist on to talk about the long-term effects of even relatively mild COVID infection, which exists. But in fact, these trainees could then no, not go into the hospital to t- take care of patients. So there's a, a cascade effect. So, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a disease that has really affected the entire world. It's affected everything we think about. But I think if we all work together, um, we can get to the point where we are ready for a vaccine that will help us uh, help take us over the next step. So now on that cheery note, uh, so cheery. We, can, uh, we can introduce our amazing guests. OK, so Dr. Claudette Lejeune is going to join us. She's an associate professor, of Department of Orthopedic Surgery at NYU Grossman School of Medicine. She does both knee and hip joint surgery. And she's uh, published uh, several different research in- interests, and we're so excited to have her. Uh, one of her focuses has been on reduction in opioid use in joint replacement, which is fantastic. And then also we have Dr. Benjamin Chang, a professor of surgery at the Division of Plastic Surgery at HUP, which is the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania, and CHOP. Love these acronyms, Children's <laughs> Hospital Philadelphia. And he does hand surgery, and we're going to uh, get a chance to talk to him about um, injuries that can occur that need to be addressed, as well as he was involved in the first pediatric hand transplant, bilateral hand transplant that was ever done. So we can talk about that with him later on. So welcome, you guys. Well, thanks for having us. How are you guys? <laughs> it's so nice to see both of you. Um, uh, welcome to our show, and thank you so much for taking the time on your Sunday to share your pearls of wisdom with our audience. Uh, we will. We already have questions that have come in from the audience, and we'll continue to do so, and uh, we'll try to get to as many of those as we can. But first, let's talk about how you've been doing uh, since March, really, since the quarantine and the pandemic. And maybe, Claudette, you can tell us a bit about your life and your practice uh, for the last few months? Well, um, you know, it's been crazy, obviously. Um, Well, I don't know how much uh, you all know, but I did actually have COVID. I was pretty sick. I had it. um, Yes, I had it at the end of March, early April. I was not hospitalized, uh, mainly out of stubbornness. I think most people probably would have gone to the hospital. Um, Couldn't really walk across a room. The only way I could get up the steps was to hold, hold on to my dog. Um, it was not fun. Um, and, uh, it took me about really a month to get over all of the symptoms. Uh, but I did go back to work and I was on the COVID army at NYU Langone, which was a volunteer core of people who normally don't do medical service. So I had to kind of relearn how to use a stethoscope. So I was on the COVID wards for the rest of the time, uh, taking care of COVID patients on 12 hour shifts. And it was very eye-opening. And I, I thought it was actually um, 
an interesting perspective, having had it and recovered from it, and then going back and taking care of patients who had the disease, uh, because um, everyone was so afraid then, and and it was so early on that everyone was you know terrified to go into the rooms and touch the patients and examine them, and I really I wasn't because I'd already had it. So the the look on the patient's face just to have someone go in and actually put their hands on them and touch them and and even just to comfort them, it was a, such a relief for them to have someone actually make contact with them, and I felt very happy to be able to do that. And also to be able to share with them that I had recovered uh, and that they could see maybe they had some hope of recovering themselves and getting back to their jobs and their lives as, as I had. Um, so, you know, having had that perspective, it was, it was good that I was able to do that. Um, all of our orthopedic surgeries were suspended. My last surgery uh, before the pandemic was, was March 16th. So they canceled pretty much all of my hip and knee replacement surgeries. And then we began uh, doing elective surgery again at the be beginning middle of, of May. And those were the surgeries that had been delayed. And those patients were really not doing so great. I mean, you can imagine someone who has very bad hip or knee arthritis that had booked surgery and, and couldn't walk. And the reason they booked surgery is because they were so bad that they couldn't take it um, and then had it delayed for another two months it was at a point where they really couldn't wait anymore. So we, we started doing that up again. And I'd say I'm around, around at maybe 85 to 90% of normal right now. Uh, in, going terms back of, to in terms of your practice or in terms of how you feel? Because a lot of patients who've had COVID say they still have some, um, like they get a little twinge in their lung or they still have some residual. Uh, and also, did you have that... Um, and is it anjusia? Is that what it's called, or anosmia? What? Anosmia? Oh, I, oh, I, oh, I couldn't take smell anything for like more than a month, uh, which it's is fine. For me. I lost some weight, which is good. I didn't. So, so, Marina, maybe there's some sort of you know thing about COVID that has a weight loss of you know variable in it that maybe you, we can isolate something about that. that I don't may, may be beneficial, beneficial in the future. I don't know. I don't know. A few years from well, now, maybe. Jh Kim, uh, Jh Kim, we love our viewers and uh, Jh. <laughs> Claudette just asked about your back room, like what's going on behind you. So if you could just share, because <laughs> I, I have guitars in my house too, but like I'm not sitting in front of them right now. So, oh, so this my 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 uh, these are my husband's uh, 1980s vintage uh, guitars. He's a he's a guitarist and he loves the 1980s. And I think a lot of folks during this time of the pandemic are, uh, I think, having these things of that they're doing something they they would you know never did and always wanted to do. So this is something he's always wanted to do is get these these guitars he, he, he coveted in the, in the 1980s when he was learning how to play the guitar. Um, and so he went and he's, he's found a bunch of them online and gotten them and he has them displayed. I guess he has more than this, but I've told him he's allowed, he, they need to be contained to this room. <laughs> he's not allowed to let yeah, them into yeah. the room. <laughs> so these are his, these are his guitars. Yeah. I think that's wonderful. So, so back to, you know, you were asking about recovery and any residual symptoms that I have. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the lung symptoms were difficult. I really, it was very hard to breathe for a, a while. Um, and I did actually end up having a secondary kind of a bacterial pneumonia, which was tough. And I took uh, antibiotics for that, um, which that went away. Um, so really the breathing symptoms, aside from just being kind of out of shape, um, are gone. But what I do have are, you know, Raynaud's um, uh, symptoms. My fingers turn blue and tingle um, a lot more than, you know, most people. Um, that's really the, the biggest thing I still have is that. Yeah. So, uh, Ben, how has things been in Philadelphia for you? And what happened with your practice? And what did you see as a maybe a direct result of some of the fears in the pandemic time? Well, it was interesting for me because I was actually out of the country in Guatemala doing a uh, mission trip uh, in the first week of um, March. And so when I came back, uh, I came back to a completely different world. Uh, things were beginning to shut down. Um, you know, in Guatemala, the temperature screened all of us coming in and out. In the United States, nothing. Uh, so I walked into Philadelphia International Airport and I just got home. And then, you know, um, the hospitals notified me that uh, one hospital, the, the adult hospital said, Guatemala is fine. You know, you don't need to do anything special. Uh, and CHOP said, no, you need a quarantine for two weeks. The problem is I was on call the second week uh, after I got back uh, for, you know, hand trauma for a week. And so, um, you know, things were in flux. They said, well, uh, if you're essential, then maybe we'll quarantine you for a week 
and then get you tested on Sunday and see if, you know, you can still take calls starting Monday. That's what I end up doing. Um, my practice completely shut down except for emergencies. So for about two months, it was just emergencies. Um, you know, all our <clears throat> elective cases got uh, canceled and uh, eventually had, had to be rescheduled. Um, and then we ramped up pretty quickly with, um, uh, you know, video visits to check on people who've had surgery before or were missing their appointments. So uh, we went up to probably a third of our normal volume uh, with just video visits. So that was one good thing is we learned how to use that technology. And then for the last, I would say about two months, uh, we've been back doing elective surgeries and we're back to about 75% on the pediatric side and 100% on the adult side in terms of surgical volume. Um, so we test all the patients for COVID before they come in to the OR. And uh, I've actually had, uh, while on call, I had three patients who had no idea they had COVID who tested positive. You know, we still had to do it because they had an injury that required early treatment. Um, but, you know, we did, you know, all the PPE and, and took precautions and that went fine. So it's been a, a little bit of an interesting trip. Can you really identify hand or knee and hip injuries by telehealth? Like, can you know, like, is it possible? Like, I'll say, like, for me, you know, if I'm seeing someone for reflux or for, for weight loss surgery, I'm not so worried about the physical exam as much. Um, a lot of my colleagues that do uh, a tremendous amount of hernia, and I did see a hernia patient actually during the time, but, you know, I ended up seeing him in person because he was having an acute issue. But a lot of my patients who are seeing patients for, you know, hernia were also doing telehealth. And that's, of course, a little bit like, you know, you're lifting your shirt up to show the hernia, having them cough. It's, it's still not what we're trained to do, which is touch, feel. And for you guys moving the joints and, and hearing the clicks or feeling nodules, like that's got to be an important aspect of telehealth or, or, excuse me, your exam, which you may not be able to get through telehealth. What happened during that time for you guys? Maybe Claudette, you want to start? Oh, well, no, you can start. Well, for me, I, uh, the hands-on part is actually very important in hand surgery. And like many other specialties that depend on MRI and CT scan, a lot of what we do for diagnosis is really just feeling the, the hands, the joints, et cetera. Uh, the other issue is some of these patients need an x-ray. And so if you're doing telehealth, it's hard to get an x-ray on them. So I found it uh, hard on many of the diagnoses. It was a good technique for follow-up patients. You know, patients that are coming in for the one-year follow-up after I'd done some doctor repair, for example, I asked them to send pictures in in advance and could see the move on video. Um, you know, patients who are just coming in for uh, routine post-operative uh, exams, especially on the kids, I always use absorbable stitches, so they, they don't need to have their stitches taken. I just need to see that they're healed. But um, some of the other things where the diagnosis is in doubt is, you know, very challenging. I think Claudette will probably have the same, uh, you know, problem with the, the knees and shoulders. Claudette? Uh, yeah, it's, it's a little more difficult to do an exam. And actually, um, telemedicine, considering that we had to do it so quickly and enlist, um, start this technology on the fly, really. We didn't have a lot of time, a lot of lead time to, to teach the physicians how to use it and to teach the patients how to use it. It was more difficult to do the physical exam. But I think that now that we have um, the understanding of the challenges, we'll be able to learn how to make a physical exam doable on telehealth. So yes, a lot. I have a lot of people that I got to see the, in their entire apartment before I got to see their knee. You know, I got to see, no, the, no that's your cat. No, that's your yeah. feeling. No, that's your window. No, point at your knee. So it was actually kind of fun because my pay, a lot of my patients are elderly, so they don't know the technology either. So I got a tour of their homes. I got to see their whole family. And then eventually I would see the joint that they, that, so they could point it at there. Um, but, you know, so it was a little bit of a challenge. However, a lot of what we do, and you can't emphasize this enough, and I think telemedicine really taught me this again, is just listening to the patient. And this forum and this way of, of interacting with the patient has really underlined how important it is to listen and how much you can actually just get out of hearing the story and listening to the patient and, and having an uninterrupted dialogue. 
And it's amazing how much of a diagnosis you can get correct just by listening to the story, especially with orthopedics, because there are some very textbook things that come out of people's mouths that you hear them say, and then you say, you know what, I probably have 95% of this. And if I put my hands on you, I would get the other 5%. Um, and, and it's pretty remarkable how close you can get just by hearing the whole story from the person. And then you just get that last 5% by the, by the physical exam. Um, and of course, imaging is very important, especially for me where, you know, you have arthritis and you want to verify what you get from the history and the physical examination. But it, it really did. It was remarkable how much I, I surprised myself by how much I got just by really listening to the patient and hearing the whole story from them. Yeah, I, I think I have to say it was a little hard to look inside the ear on, <laughs> on telemedicine visits. You suffered so. <laughs> I did have a lot of like do this ah and kind of auto Weber, like do fake tuning fork tests at home. And there are actually some online uh, audiogram apps that are not terrible. And so at least I could tell the difference between something that needed emergent care and something that needed um, maybe could wait a bit or could be temporized a bit. Um, I wonder, uh, Claudette, if you can talk to us, because you've written a lot about uh, opioids and pain management. And one of the questions that came in was the role for maybe CBD oil for uh, post-operative or joint pain. I wonder if you can talk to us about, you know, the, the cri there, COVID is not the only crisis in the, in this country and the oh, opioid no. <laughs> crisis continues. So perhaps you can talk to us a bit about pre and post-operative pain management and, and how you see our role as physicians. Well, you know, do, do you have another <laughs> this a lot? Um, so, you know, before we go, just I just wanted one more point about the physical exam. You talked a little bit about technology and we haven't had the chance to catch up for telemedicine physical exam technology. Just you wait. There are going to be so many applications that you can use to measure things and to look at things that a patient can have in their home that they can say, Oh, what's your hand exam like? What's your ear exam like? You point it into your ears. There will be ways that you can look in someone's ear remotely. Just you wait. In a few years or a few months, probably, there will be a way for you to look in someone's ear because technology and the, and the innovation, especially of, of people in the United States, because we have such an amazing uh, system where um, we have people who are entrepreneurs and who want to invent things, we will invent this stuff. That's number one. Now to opioids. So the, the opioid problem is a big problem. And we as physicians, especially orthopedic surgeons who deal with a lot of painful conditions, were big, prob big problems here. We would prescribe a lot of opioids. And we, were, uh, we realized this and we have checked ourselves. There were a lot of regulations that tried to check prescribing, but only when the surgeons themselves really looked at the different um, procedures and said, all right, so really how many pills do we really need for these procedures? And we looked at them ourselves and we created our own guidelines and we studied this and we realized that, okay, this is how many pills we really need. That's how many we should prescribe. And that's where we saw the real decrease in numbers. We actually studied this too. We published a paper on it. We looked at the effect of the regulations and we saw how the pill numbers dropped. And then we looked at the effect of the physician intervention. So the pill numbers dropped by regulations. And then once the physician intervention happened, they really dropped. So it really does take the physicians to really get in there and, and look at their own practices and, and change how opioids uh, are, are prescribed. The other thing we looked at is telehealth and how opioids were prescribed over the COVID crisis. We have not published this yet. We just submitted it. At our institution, from the beginning of the crisis to the end of the crisis, we looked at all opioid prescriptions. Over the time period, from the beginning to the end, the number of pills and the morphine mill equivalents consistently increased. So yeah. over the entire lockdown, we have a formula that we found, and it was, a. I mean, our, our statistician came up with it as, um, Y equals 1.309 times X plus 64.24, where X is the week of the prescription since March 1st. So by week, 1.3 times the morphine mill equivalents were prescribed by all prescribers at NYU via telemedicine. So over the course of the lockdown, 
probably because no one had access to operations, injections, other treatments, people were getting more opioids. So you, you have these secondary effects of people not being having access to their doctors of, of increased opioid prescribing. So, you know, there are other things that you can do like CBD oil and supplements, but what happened is people were getting more opioids via calling their doctors, calling their pain management physicians, calling their primary care doctors. So, you know, for our, for our viewers, and by the way, if you guys are watching and you like what you're seeing and you want to share, you can tweet, retweet us on, uh, obviously on Twitter, and you can also share on Facebook or uh, YouTube or LinkedIn. Um, but one of the facts that I learned when I was looking at um, enhanced recovery procedures uh, or, or protocols for after surgery, um, I had no idea that 6% of people of naive users of opioids get addicted. That's crazy. Of course, now during quarantine, you're not around 50 people. But if you were, three of them could get addicted. I mean, you know, that's that's a that is a high rate of addiction amongst naive users. And that's why, you know, I appreciate so much, Claudette, what you you guys have done looking at it. And you're right. Bone pain, we've said, is the worst pain that anyone could ever have. Is it is, wait, is bone pain considered worse than kidney stone pain? That's well, what I was going to say. Kidney stone pain is probably worse. Kidney stone worse. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Good to know. Because they say kidney stone work pain is worse than uh, child pain child labor, uh, labor, and I was like, oh, that was pretty painful. So I'm glad I don't have any kidney stones. But so if 6% are at risk, this is why it's so important for ha us to have enhanced recovery and use other substances like, you know, um, gabapentin, which is something that's given for nerve pain or giving, uh, maximizing our use of Tylenol or, or ibuprofen to sort of um, decrease the inflammatory aspects of pain and address pain itself so that we can decrease the opioid use. Because I think we really ran unchecked for a, a long time and not because we ran unchecked, but all of a sudden, I remember when I was in training and you guys probably the same because we're, okay, I don't know that we're all around the same age, but well, maybe. Anyway. Pain is the fifth vital sign, no pain. Yeah, yeah we had yeah. yeah. that was so I, I just want to uh, clarify for our viewers, a naive user is not just like a baby in the woods. A naive user is a first time mm -hmm. user. So for example, when I broke my fibula, doing something as exciting as stepping off a step, uh, I was I am a naive user and my husband was advised that I post operatively stay ahead of the pain. And I looked at him, I said, what are you talking about? My bones aren't rubbing against each other. I'm not in pain. I'm not taking any more of these meds. But when physician, when patients follow physician instructions and they are naive users, I, I agree with you, Marina, the risk of uh, opioid dependence is really very high. And it's something we're learning about and doing a lot about. I'm going to switch back to Ben, if that's okay. And Ben, I want to ask you about a few things. A couple of our listeners have written in about trigger finger, about carpal tunnel, and about exercises that you can do at home to kind of, you know, loosen up your joints, kind of do this. Maybe, you know, the four of us probably do this in between surgeries because we're holding our fingers so tight. Maybe you can talk to us about sort of the more common things that we experience with our hands. So the trigger finger and carpal tunnel syndrome are two very common conditions that cause pain in the hand. Um, they're two completely separate conditions, although they can travel together. So for carpal tunnel syndrome, basically your nerve that goes up into your hand is pinched right here in your carpal tunnel, right at the base of the palm. We don't actually know what causes this in most instances. Like if you have a wrist fracture, sometimes that can set it off. But most of the people who have it just have it because they may have, you know, a little smack between the sides of the space that the nerve is in, the carpal tunnel, and the, the content, which are nine tenths plus the median nerve. So what we do is recommend that they wear a splint uh, for at least six weeks at night just to support the wrist in a good neutral position. You don't want the wrist to be down like this or all the way out like this uh, because both positions put more pressure on that nerve. So the idea is basically to rest it in a neutral position and allow some of the swelling to go down so that the nerve recovers. Um, some people have tried doing exercise with carpal tunnel syndrome. I, I have not seen any good evidence that it actually works. Trigger finger is a slightly different condition. It involves the tendons that go up the finger. And so when they bend down, as they start straightening, the, the finger gets stuck and then snaps. 
and that hurts when it snaps. And it's usually a mismatch, again, between the size of the tendon and the tunnel that it has to go through, the uh, flexor tendon sheath. So what we recommend for that is actually, you, for mild cases, you can have them do called tendon gliding exercises where you keep them from bending all the way down like this where they might get stuck. But we have them get a splint made by the hand therapist that keeps the fingers up like this. And so they're bending just the two joints towards the end. And that allows the tendons to slide in and out. And for all cases, that does uh, work sometimes. Uh, both the conditions actually will improve with steroid injection, which can be done pretty safely and quickly in the office. It takes about five minutes. And uh, both of them, you know, essentially can be cured by releasing either the tendon sheath for a triggered uh, finger or the transverse carpal ligament for a carpal tunnel syndrome. So if the exercises and splinting, et cetera, don't work, we you know, recommend surgery. And they're you know, both highly effective, those operations. So, Ben, can people do these kind of exercises on their own? Can they, like, take a picture of the screen of the screen we just showed and kind of do them on their own? Or do they run the risk of hurting themselves? And I'm going to ask you, and then I'm going to ask Claudette the same thing. There's so many exercises available on the Internet. Are these safe, or are we putting ourselves in some sort of harm's way? I don't think it's actually dangerous to do any of these exercises. The question is, which exercises should you be doing for your particular condition? So like the exercise you have up on the screen now, the hand exercise, are generally good for uh, patients who may be recovering from a fracture or, or you know, wrist injury, et cetera. So you want to move all the joints, make sure they get back to action. Um, but for specific conditions, there may be some exercise that you shouldn't do and then other exercise that you should emphasize. So usually I recommend they see a therapist for one or two sessions and get a program going so the therapist will teach them which exercises are most beneficial for the condition they have and then monitor, you know, how they're doing it. And then, um, they, you know, if, if they have a good understanding of it, there's no reason why they can't take these diagrams from the therapist and continue doing the program at home. I was Especially important with, with uh, COVID, you don't really, you want to decrease the number of, you know, contact points. So it's another thing we've been doing is shortening the, you know, a mass uh, episode that they have in person. Half the battle is making time to do it, right? So while you were talking, I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think everybody oh, was trying to do them while we were listening to you. Where's the ball? That's what we need. <laughs> no, well, that's just... half. That's half the battle is is figuring out which exercises to do because. The, you know, you're, you're right, Suja, everything on the internet, there's so much out there and it's a question of what's garbage and what's not garbage. That's the first question. And the second question is, which one do you use for what's, what you have? You know, so you need to do a lot of looking around to figure out what, what's the quality of the, the, the piece of information you're looking at. And then is this the right piece of information for the thing that's wrong with me? And that's why we are professionals and do this all the time. Um, so, you know, folks who come into the office with a stack of things they got off the internet and start going, well, I read this and I read this and I read this. And I'm like, well, then why are you here? You know, what's the point of you coming here if you are already an expert at this and you looked at everything on the internet? The point of the internet is to maybe help you find resources after you've spoken with me and I help you guide you to look, to tell you what to look for. Um, because right now there's just too much out there to really know what's high quality and what's not. Um, and really, that's that's what we're here for. And then what, what Ben said is to go to a, a physical therapist or go to someone who can guide you through the first wave and teach you how to do the things properly before you do them on your own. Because I can't tell you, people come in, they say, oh, yeah, I did the bicycle. I've been doing the bicycle, but my knee still hurts. I'm like, well, how are you setting up the bicycle? Right. And they have it all set up incorrectly. It's too high or too low or they're putting the tension way too high or they're using their, you know, their, their spouse's bicycle, which is too big for them or there's a whole variety of things that can go wrong when you do an exercise incorrectly and they're actually making something worse. And then they, they, they write it off. They say, Oh, that didn't work. I tried it. So, yeah. you know, you have to make sure you're doing the correct thing and you're doing it in the correct way. And it is the thing that is supposed to fix what's wrong with you. Let, let's okay. switch gears from, from stretching exercises, which by the way, Claudette, you said, yes, we need to do things, but you didn't say what you do for the knee or the, the hip, yeah. I think are more difficult than the, the wrists and the fingers. It depends on what's wrong with you. I yeah. mean, really, there's a million, there's so many structures in the hip and the knee that it depends on which structure it is that you tailor the exercise to what it is. 
But there's such a love affair with supplements in this country. I feel like more than in other countries, but I'm not sure. But like glucosamine chondroitin was huge. I even took it at some point, but I don't know. Is it beneficial? And then turmeric now is a huge thing where Sujan and I are, are Indian descent. I mean, we're Indian, not even just descent. We're just Indian. We're just and, uh, turmeric. Like, you know, everyone's like, oh, my God, don't get the turmeric on your clothes. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I got that. I know how to get that out. Like, we're good. we're good with the turmeric. But, you know, people are taking it in capsule form. They're taking it powder. They're putting it in their in their smoothies. Um, is turmeric a good thing? And then also, uh, as another supplement I've heard, my patients are like, yeah, I mean, I take collagen every day. I'm like, how are you taking collagen? Like, yeah, I put it in my drink and this. I, what is effective for joints? Like, you know, I'm at that age where, seriously, I can't do a squat without hearing this crunching noise, you know, and it's one knee worse than the other, right? But, like, are these things actually effective? What do you guys think about supplements? And then, Ben, first Claudette, and then Ben, you had mentioned injections, and we want to hear from both of you guys about injections, because I also hear from my patients, like, oh, yeah, I got, like, an injection of steroid, and I'm feeling much better, or they're like, I'm on my 20th injection of steroid, and now at this point, I got to have surgery. So those are sort of the spectrum. A lot of questions. Claudette, you first. Okay, well, there's a lot of questions that wrapped up in that one question, but supplements. So turmeric, all the natural things. Pretty much all medicines come from some natural thing, um, or a lot of medicines come from natural things. And turmeric has natural anti-inflammatory qualities. Uh, and a lot of my patients swear by it, and it does actually seem to work uh, to help reduce inflammation. So there are some natural anti-inflammatory qualities to turmeric. So if you try it and it works for you, terrific. I don't know that it has any negative side effects. There are some... Um, perhaps anticoagulation effects to it. So if you are on blood thinners, perhaps you should discuss that with your physician who prescribes the blood thinners to see if it does have an additive effect uh, to your blood thinners. But I don't know that it has any real negative effects except that. Uh, in terms of collagen, um, I'm not sure that it really does anything. Um, collagen is a building block like anything else. And if your body needs it, it may take it and use it to build things. But I don't know that it's actually helping your joints in any way besides maybe a placebo effect. Um, many supplements do have a placebo effect um, and some supplements actually have a real effect. There are a lot of uh, true holistic uh, physicians and people who have PhDs in holistic medicine. And you can, if you really wanna know which ones to take, you can consult with someone who has a degree in holistic medicine. Um, but you know that's not really my expertise. So I tell folks, if you want to spend your money on those things and try them, you can certainly try them. But the biggest side effect of them is they make your wallet skinnier. So if you're spending a lot of money on supplements and they're not helping you, uh, don't spend your money on them. And Ben, maybe you can talk a bit about uh, injections. I know you mentioned them for trigger finger. Uh, and there's actually a couple of questions that came in about ganglion cysts. So for trigger finger and carpal tunnel syndrome, uh, the steroid injections clearly work in most patients. It may not be a permanent solution, but it makes most people better, at least for a while. Uh, for ganglion cysts, uh, injection with steroids is um, not effective. So you can have them drained, basically put a needle in and uh, aspirate the fluid, suck it out. The fluid is really thick. It's lubricating fluid from the joint, so it doesn't come out easy. You need a big needle. And most of the time, it just fills back in again. So it's a good temporizing measure. Uh, adding a steroid injection after you suck out the fluid uh, has proven to be you know, no more effective than just aspiration. So uh, for ganglion cysts, I would live with it. If it's small, I would get it aspirated. If it gets big and bothering you, and as a last resort, you can have it taken out. Uh, probably my least favorite operation, uh, you know, somewhere between 15 and 25% of them come back after surgery which is not a good you know, success rate for me. So um, you don't really just take a dictionary and slam yeah. it on your hand? Like, what's up the, with that? that, that, I, that, that was work. The, I was the Bible. You just smack it I'm just like, bam. <laughs> yeah. If you rupture it. <laughs> uh, what are you guys doing? <laughs> it it does go away. But as a hand surgeon, I wouldn't recommend that because of you know, associated injuries from the smacking of the hand with a heavy object. <laughs> Generally recommend against smacking the hand in any way. That was Thank the God. whole way you just. <laughs> <laughs> um, there, there are two more questions. 
injection of fillers into the hand or into the joint? And is it okay to crack your knuckles? Well, I'll take crack your knuckles. Uh, perfectly fine. I've been doing it all my life. And uh, there's actually oh, studies on it. You've done it. That's okay. <laughs> and I feel great about it. Um, so go ahead and crack all you want. Uh, and then injection of fillers. Um, I've seen some excellent results for aging hands. Uh, I have not been able to talk myself into it in my practice. Um, I just, uh, you know, it's it's a whole other line of thinking when you're, you know, giving medical treatment for somebody for purely, you know, cosmetic reasons, which is, you know, part of what plastic surgery is. But for my practice, I have not been uh, doing that. So uh, they they can get very good uh, results with fillers or uh, injected fat. They can get liposuction, have some of the fat put into the hand. Part of the aging that you see in hands is the skin gets thinner, and then there's sort of atrophy of the fat underneath the skin. So the youthful hand you see, you know, got good skin tone, uh, it's relatively smooth, and you don't see the veins as much. When you lose that layer of subcutaneous fat, your veins become very prominent, and the, thin, you know, the skin is thin, and then you see all these, you know, nooks and crannies between your bones. Uh, you know, so you could have spent a lot of money on a facelift, and people look at your hands and go, oh, yeah. She's in her 60s. So, you know, a lot of people want to have their hands done so mean, ben. <laughs> to complement their other, you know, aesthetic surgery. And I think that's a perfectly good reason, just not by me. I'm going to tell all of you guys a secret. Have you ever been out like uh, at a at a bar or like a social gathering like years ago? Not not recently, because hello. Hello. <laughs> but when people are like, guess how old I am? And I look at them. And I immediately go to right here. I turn their, I, I haven't turned their face. Or I walk around them and I look at them. And then I look right here. And uh -huh. almost always, it depends so on melanin and, uh, you know, like skin tone and uh, elasticity of the skin. But almost always, if they're over age 35, you'll see a little line right before the ear. And that's how I can tell. Like sometimes people do look young, but then I look. And if that wrinkles there, I, then I kind of think about, you know, who they are, what they did. And I come in like really close within five years. So little secret to all our viewers. Is it a wrinkle or the facelift oh. incision? Really? No, that's no, that's no. Not, a little wrinkle. Um, facelift incision. Just, I know we're talking about really common stuff and, and I really appreciate both of you educating all of us. But let's talk about something very just extremely unusual, even rare and very cool. And that's the first bilateral hand transplant that was done at CHOP by a big team that included you, Ben, uh, about in 2015. And bilateral, for people who don't know, means both sides. So actually both hands were transplanted. And perhaps you can tell us, you know, very briefly who Zion was, how he came to, to have this problem, uh, and who gave their hands and how, how it happened. So Zion's a remarkable boy. He's a young man now, but he, um, at the time that I met him, he was eight years old. At the age of two, he had a very bad uh, episode of sepsis uh, infection, basically. And um, the, he, he lost both his hands and both his feet. So when you go into sepsis, you can't maintain your blood pressure. They give you medication to you know, support your blood pressure, but that also causes blood flow to the hands and feet to stop. And so they had to amputate his hands and feet. So he, he lived from age two to age eight with no hands and no feet. Of note, he also, at age four, uh, he had kidney failure because of the sepsis. And at age four, his mother donated a kidney to him so he could come off of dialysis. Um, so he showed up at our clinic at age eight after he'd been to the Shriners here in Philadelphia. They were taking care of his you know, prosthetic limbs, basically, they, you know, making it for him and, and uh, you know, have him go through therapy and learn how to use them, et cetera. He was actually doing quite well with the legs, but the hands just never worked well for him. And it was remarkable. He had amputations at the forearm level on both, both sides. What he could do on his iPad uh, with just the forearms. Um, and uh, so we, we met him, uh, the surgeons at the um, at the Shriners are good friends of ours. And they knew that we'd done a bilateral hand transplant on an adult about two years prior to We had a program we started at Chuck just hadn't done anybody. We started it with a big committee of people to uh, get this going on the pediatric side as well. And we interviewed him and actually 
you know, evaluate him over about a year, uh, going through all different, you know, specialties, social work to pharmacology to, you know, uh, therapy, um, as well as all the medical specialties, because having a transplant really alters your life uh, completely and permanently. So we want to make sure that he could psychologically and physically withstand uh, having a transplant and also got a, a chance to really, um, you know, get a feel for whether uh, he would succeed at all the stuff we're going to ask him to do afterwards. So after the transplant, uh, he basically had to go into full-time therapy for about, you know, nine or 10 months, full-time, like six hours a day therapy. And for a child that age, you know, it's sometimes hard to get them focused to that degree. But the more times we met him and his family, the more we're convinced that, you know, this, this might actually work in Zion. And so uh, we did, you know, I think four or five rehearsals in the lab uh, to kind of design his operation, break it down into steps. Once we felt uh, that we were ready to go ahead with it, we listed him for transplant, just like you would for a heart, lungs, or kidney, et cetera. And so they uh, actually found a child within a, a few months who uh, uh, was brain dead and was donating other organs. And they approached the family to ask if they would be willing to donate the hands for a transplant. And unfortunately, the family said yes. So we were looking for somebody with the right size hands and also the right skin tone. So obviously, you know, the hands are something you see just like the face. And unlike a transplanted kidney, the you know, appearance actually makes a big difference. So we didn't want to transplant hands that are either way too small, way too big, or the wrong color. And this was a very good match. So um, my partner, Scott Levin, um, he's sort of on the away team. Uh, we sent him to procure the limbs while I took Brian to the operating room at CHOP to get him set up for the surgery. It takes about two hours to get them under anesthesia, get the catheter in, get the pain catheters in that we use to give them, um, you know, pain relief after the surgery. So once we got all that done, uh, they called and said, these hands look like they're in good condition. We should go ahead. And so with uh, two teams at, at um, you know, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, we did right and left hand teams. Uh, we started uh, with three surgeons on each side, dissecting out all the structures that we had to repair. So everything from the skin, nerves, you know, tendons, all the way down to, you know, the blood vessels and bones and labeled everything. And then by that time, they brought the hands back and we had two other teams. So we had four teams in the operating room operating at the same time. And the, the uh, you know, parts had to be dissected just the same way. You open everything up, tag all the structures. And once everything was identified, uh, we put it together. So put the hands on the forearms, basically. Now we're back to two teams. And so we start from the inside, you know, secured the uh, bones with uh, plate and screws and then work on the nerves and blood vessels, eventually the tendons and then close the skin. So the whole operation took, I think, just short of 11 hours. Wow. Um, and we, yeah, um, video of him. we set the schedule up. Go ahead. We no, you, you you shared with us a, a recent video of him um, and and how he's been doing. Just because we're running a little out of time, I wanted to show that. I mean, it's a you know to do any kind of transplant takes several hours and so much preparation and so much teamwork. And specifically, when you're looking at you know face transplant or or all the other transplants that have been done, and now bilateral hand transplants, it's 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 a critical amount of time. And actually. When you said it just took 11 hours, I was like, that's it? That's, that's it. <laughs> very efficient, very efficient. So maybe Julia, who's one of our producers, can play us that a little clip of the video of what Zion was able to do last year, which is four years after his surgery. Amazing, right? I have all four limbs. And I'm just like, I can't do that. 
Yeah, exactly. Um, we just have a few more minutes. We could talk with you guys for hours. We really appreciate uh, your spending the time with us. Um, Claudette, we're going to just, you've done so much work in gender diversity uh, and gender issues in surgery. And we're definitely going to have you back uh, for for talking about that. Ben, everyone's got a million more hand issues. Perhaps we you can leave our audience maybe with three nuggets, three takeaways, Claudette, that you'd like them to know. Uh, and, and before the nugget, maybe you can just talk to us very briefly about how long joint replacements last. So how long and then three nuggets. Okay, so joint replacements are awesome because very few parts of your body, just like we just learned, do you have somewhere in a box that we just put in you if they wear out or you lose them. So we have hips, knees, shoulders, elbows. We have them in a box for you. We can put them in. And the older versions of them, you know, maybe we thought they would last 10 years, 20 years. We weren't sure. The newer versions with the newer bearing surfaces, they're lasting longer than we thought. So we don't know. We thought 15 years for knees. It seems like they're outlasting that. Some hip replacements I'm seeing 30 years later and they're still going. So it really depends on how you use them. If you decide you're going to go play tennis every day on them, you'll probably wear them out faster. But if you're just walking around and doing normal activities, who knows? They can last a very, very long time. Uh, so that's that. So my takeaway points uh, related to the opioids and what we saw with COVID. Um, yes, COVID is awful. I had it myself, but the effects of the lockdown are also pretty awful. Um, we need to be a little bit judicious about how we're handling this and recognize that we are having to deal with some effects of the lockdown and we need to be aware that, you know, there are some health effects that from the neglect of all the health conditions that have, that we're seeing them now. Uh, we need to address them. We're going to see a lot of people with uncontrolled diabetes, hypertension, problems with opioids because they've not had their medical conditions uh, addressed. Uh, we need to be very aware of those things. Um, and the positive element of that is that we're going to get through this. We need to be uh, wash our hands. If you're sick, stay home. Uh, wear a surgical mask. Don't wear a cloth mask. They're not really as useful. Um, and, and be aware. Take care of your family. Take care of yourself. Thank you. And Thank Ben, you. your three takeaways before we have to uh, close out this segment. I encourage people not to delay treatment for um, hand injuries, particularly if there's tendon, nerve, or you know, bone injury like a fracture. Most of those are best taken care of within one or two weeks of injury. So if you delay too long, it may be a that can't be fixed or can't be fixed as well. Second point is if you can move it, doesn't mean it ain't broke. So that's an old wives' tale. Um, people said, well, I had no idea it was broken because I could still move it. That is absolutely not true. And I think Claudia backed me up on that. <laughs> the third thing is, what is the most important thing that we can do to fight COVID? Aside from the three W's, vote. Um, I think there's been an excess number of deaths in this country based on an inadequate response that is still ongoing. And that has to change. So I would encourage people to go out and vote or mail in their ballots. Thank you, Ben, and thank you, Claudette. Dr. Ben Chang is a professor of plastic surgery and a hand surgery specialist at the University of Pennsylvania and Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Dr. Claudette Lejeune is associate professor of orthopedic surgery and a specialist in knee and hip issues at NYU Langone and NYU Grossman School of Medicine in New York. Thank you so much for spending your Sunday uh, with us. And um, there are lots of questions in the in the chat. So if you don't mind coming back into the She's On Call Facebook page and trying to answer the ones that we didn't get to, our audience would really appreciate it. But thank you guys so much for spending the time with us. Thanks so Thanks much. So much. Guys. Thanks. Also, yeah, it's our pleasure. We also want to thank our, uh, our team, you know, because this is not done in a vacuum. It's not just me and Sujit doing this. It's we have wonderful producers and um, our, our co-executive producer, Dr. Um, Dr. C. Sri, <laughs> again, Sri Srinivasan. It's his mother's Sri dream. Doctor. Uh, but, um, you know, without them, uh, we would not be able to do this. We want to thank you guys for watching. We also want to let you know that um, two things. One, um, next week we're going to have a great show and uh, we have um, – uh, 
we're going to be talking about fear of success or and, and also COVID related issues that arose in mental health with Dr. Judith Chusid. And then also Carmen Simmons is coming on and she's a fourth year medical student going into family practice. And we're going to get some of her insights of what her last year in med school is like. And um, actually she may even have start. well, she's going to be still in her fourth year and see what's going on with her. So that it'll be next week. And then also Suju and I are going to go through some of the questions. We had so many from last week's show, which was on, um, Schools reopening. We had so many. So so look around for that because we're going to do another shorter session just answering those questions because there were so many great questions that we didn't get to last week. And thank you guys so much for joining us and for your comments. And it really it makes us um, very energetic and gives us a lot of energy when we see all your comments. So thank you guys so much. And we'll see you for our special section about answering the schools opening questions. And then we'll see you again next week. Yep. And don't forget to share and like on uh, at She's On Call, both on Twitter, YouTube and Facebook and LinkedIn. Bye, you guys. Bye.